You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Eric Day. He is a venture associate at Pillar VC. He's also the co-founder and managing director for BioLaunch. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks. Great to have, uh, it's great to be here, Dr. Roxy. Yeah, great to have you here. So um, I always like to start off by having my guests uh, share a little bit about your background and what you've been doing these days, just to kind of give our audience a little bit of context for our conversation today. Yeah, so um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And I think I can break myself down into uh, maybe two main components that describe who I am as a person. The first one is the work I do in science. And the second one is the work I do in and uh, working together with other people, so connecting people. So I can talk first about my science. I've kind of been a lifelong scientist. I am a PhD student in bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm in the lab of Robert Mock, where I study uh, stem cell engineering for regenerative medicine. And so what that basically means is stem cells are these cells with um, pluripotency. They can turn into many different kinds of cells. And the question that we have in our lab is um, what guides that pluripotency? How do you turn a cell from a naive state into a terminal or differentiated state or a functional state. And so um, by answering those questions, we can then um, start to guide cells in a more uh, guided manner or a more targeted manner towards specific uh, behaviors to regenerate a lost or damaged or somehow misfunctioning tissues in the body. And so in our lab, we specifically focus on the orthopedic musculoskeletal system. So looking at um, systems like uh, your joints and your spine to um, take stem cells and then hopefully regenerate these previously uh, kind of unregenerable or unhealable tissues. Um, so that's kind of the focus of my work in the lab. It's like and anti-aging. It's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's, use some new joints, Eric. <laughs> I, I couldn't, we all, yeah. I'm, I'm hitting that age where it's, it's, it's starting to become real to me, uh, you know, joint pain and things like that. Yep, so yep. <laughs> my parents are definitely there too. So it's, it's something that really affects a lot of people. It's, it's probably some of the, I think it's the second or third most prevalent diseases behind um, uh, kind of like heart disease and, and cancer. So, um, super, super big, super big deals in the United States and around the world. Yeah. So the other part of my background is my work in business or my work in really bringing people together. So, um, I've been really fortunate to, uh, do my PhD at the university of Pennsylvania, which has the Wharton school of business. So we have a really strong community for, um, kind of biotech business on campus. And I got involved with that pretty early in my PhD when I realized it was something that I could uh, become good at and something that I could get excited about. And so my work there has uh, spanned a lot of different areas, but most recently it's been in um, two main ones, which is in um, a biotech accelerator I helped launch at Penn. So that's called Penn BioLaunch. Um, and we recently actually became Nucleate Philly. So we're part of the um, a national organization called Nucleate, um, which we're really proud of. It's, a, it's an organization that brings um, over a thousand people across the United States spanning uh, researchers, um, uh, physicians, entrepreneurs, investors um, from some of the top firms and some of the top universities. And we bring them all together to uh, start new companies in biotech. So it's something that we're really excited about and, and we're really passionate about building. And the other thing that I'm involved in is um, I'm a venture associate at uh, Pillar VC um, and specifically in the bio arm of Pillar VC, which is Petri. And in there we invest in uh, kind of transformational technologies and invent- inventors at the inter- working at the intersection of biology and engineering to um, help solve some really important and impactful questions uh, in healthcare, sustainability, and other spaces. So, so, um, Lots of exciting things happen. Uh, I can see the common thread that's woven between all of those initiatives, but each one kind of gives you a different angle on things. Going back to um, Pen Bio Launch, you know there are so many um, accelerators and incubators already throughout the country. So, um, you know, from your perspective, what's still missing, and what is something that maybe um, you know this. Uh, accelerator or, or incubator brings to the marketplace that kind of meets that unmet need or fills that gap? Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing question. I think it's one that's definitely worth addressing. I think um, what Penn Bio Launch and what, what is now Nucleate really um, serves to address is that unmet layer between academia and industry. And what I say by that, what I mean by that is that you know some of the most cutting edge innovative science in the world is happening happening in our academic university labs, and so these are PhD students, these are postdocs, um, these are physicians who are going into the lab and doing some incredible research, 
Um, but because they don't have that business training, they don't have that business background, and they don't know what's possible with their research, when it comes time to take that research and turn it into something that really has a practical impact on the world through, um, through patient care, through new therapeutic discovery, um, through new diagnostics, uh, so on and so forth, um, they don't know how to answer that question is, is what we're finding time and time again. And so looking at this problem in this white space in um, kind of the, the intersection between academia and industry, um, we decided to create something that was really targeted towards specifically academics, um, you know, towards those PhD students, postdocs, um, and then create an opportunity for them to get involved in entrepreneurship um, during their PhD or during their postdoc without having to kind of leave their programs. And so they don't have to make that zero to hundred leap uh, into entrepreneurship. They can try it out first and, and meet, make connections, understand what the process is like and, and start to uh, build a company without leaving their PhD or postdoc. You know, that's, that's so important. And I think it's a conversation that we don't have enough is be able to bridge this gap between research and um, practice. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of very experienced uh, entrepreneurs and innovators out there that, um, you know, don't always apply the latest in science and business acumen um, or commercialization expertise. And then, you know, very often I'll hear, um, you know, oh, you really don't want to pilot with anybody in academia because they're just trying to publish a paper. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something yeah. that's going to be commercialized. And so it's nice to, um, you know, kind of think of being able to bridge these two in a, in a more meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that I think has been a long time coming, but uh, the time is now. Um, I think what we're seeing uh, with the pandemic is that First, uh, biotech is more than ever um, one of the driving forces of innovation and change in society, right? The COVID-19 vaccines um, were only possible because of the cutting edge science that is happening at universities um, and, and big pharma companies for um, you know, decades at this point. And, and that was just a convergence of all these things coming together. And you know, the, the, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines took less than a week to develop in the lab, right? They tested they took less than a week to develop and took just a few months to approve, which is um, unprecedented timelines. And I think that's the kind of thing we're going to be seeing more and more going forward. So we're going to be seeing unprecedented timelines of discovery and approval for drugs, um, not just in infectious diseases, but also in cancer and Alzheimer's. Um, recently, an Alzheimer's a vaccine uh, was put into phase one trials. So, so, so exciting to think of the idea that, you know, in 50 years, we could eradicate diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's and, and um, heart disease and any number of other things that, that plague us as a, as a, as a, as a civilization. Yeah, you know, it, it it really would be incredible to truly transform the health of of the nation of the world. <laughs> That's in a, yeah. In a meaningful way. Um, I talk a lot about the statistic that 95% of innovations that are brought to market fail. They fail to reach any adequate level of customer adoption or financial ROI. And and so, you know that's actually kind of how I got into my career path um, in the last decade is really trying to figure out why, what's going on. And, and kind of to your point is, is that you've got all these innovations that are going to be brought to market. And if majority of, the, of them are, are going to be unsuccessful, we've got a problem. How do we fix that? And I think this bridge between academia and um, business practice is, is definitely a big step in that right direction. Uh, totally, totally. Yeah, I think um, what we saw from the tech world in the um, the two thousands up to the mid two thousand tens is such an explosion of startups, and and specifically, it's a very specific kind of stereotype or archetype that you're seeing from these startup founders. Um, generally, they're younger. Generally, they don't they don't even necessarily have a bachelor's degree. They might have dropped out of uh, undergrad, and um, they're doing something that's extremely bold and extremely visionary. And I think um, that's the same kind of trend we're seeing now in biotech, and the kind of the trend that we're trying to really foster and amplify, which is looking at these bold young founders who don't have a, a preconceived notion of what's possible or what's not possible in the world of biotech. Because um, once you become a seasoned veteran or executive in a big pharma company, or I mean, you've worked in a hospital for many decades, um, of course, you have experience, very valuable experience, I might add. Um, but what's missing might be that sense of optimism and that sense of hope about what um, hasn't been imagined yet. And so I think that's what we're seeing in biotech now is, is this new wave of founders who um, haven't been you know, jaded yet by industry and, and have a chance to go out and do something really inventive and unique and innovative. Yeah. And I mean, I think sometimes we just get fat and lazy, quite honestly. 
<laughs> okay. That happens right? too. I yeah. mean, you know, we've just, we have a lot of success in our belt and, you know, we just kind of like coasting along with the status quo. And so it's, it's definitely nice to see an injection of new energy and enthusiasm to kind of reignite what can be um, that that's certainly happening. You know, one of the things that stands out to me when we were, you know, talking earlier, you mentioned the word kindness and that is, um, I've talked to hundreds of innovators. I've done hundreds of interviews and I've never had an entrepreneur talk about kindness in, um, in, in their, um, it being one of their personal goals or professional goals. So let's just peel that back a little bit. Why is that word, um, so meaningful to you and how is it playing out in, you know, personally and professionally? Yeah, I think, um, kindness and, and probably more, um, more descriptively, even goodness, I think are some of the most important traits that you can have as not. I, I, uh, so Eric, we were talking earlier and you mentioned the word kindness, and that is a word that I don't hear very often. I've had conversations with hundreds of innovators and have, you know, hundreds of guests on the show. And it's very rare that I hear someone talking about kindness and how that might fit into their personal and professional goals or even in the commercialization process. So just kind of give our audience a little bit of color around what you mean by that and how that's playing a role in, in what you're doing. Yeah. So Dr. Roxy, that's a great question. I think that's uh, so important to address because it's not talked about enough, which is the role of kindness or uh, probably more descriptively goodness and the value of our work. I think for anyone who's out there looking to make ambitious goals, uh, make an impact, um, it has to come first from a place where you're making an impact for the right reasons. And, and what right means to you is different than what right means to me or anyone else. But um, defining what goodness means to you, I think is such an important um, important process. And for me, I can, I can describe my process. I think, um, you know, I've always told myself and, and told others that um, I, I'm an ambitious person. I want to make an impact, but, you know, I have to do good before doing great. And, and what that means to me is treating others with respect, um, treating others with dignity and, and looking to do something that brightens up other people's days and, and does something good for people first and foremost. And that comes down to things as simple as social interactions. It doesn't have to be that I, you know, make a huge difference by donating a lot of money or, um, you know, creating a life-saving drug on every single day. Obviously that's not possible, but what is possible is, um, you know, treating people going out of their way, your way to treat people with respect, remember the little details about them. And, and I think these kinds of things have a really strong, um, pay it forward, uh, kind of positive amplification effect, because when you make someone else's day a little bit better and you help them believe that they can achieve more, um, tomorrow than they could have today, then, um, that kind of effect, especially if they go on and do it for someone else has such a positive feedback effect that you can't measure with, uh, you know, with, uh, with any kind of metric. It, it's something that it, it just makes society innumerably better. So I'm, I'm all about it. Okay. So is that a millennial thing or is that an Eric thing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think it's a millennial thing. I do think millennials are, are more and more about um, keeping a mind on these things in a way that maybe previously generations, previous generations weren't. Um, but maybe it's also just a me thing, but I like to think it's a generational thing. I think I'm very positive about our generation's ability to, um, to treat each other with respect and, and think about the positive implications that we can have on the world around us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I'm certainly not claiming that all millennials are like you or all millennials, you know, have that same kind of mindset, but I do think it is characteristic of, of that generation. Um, one of the beauties of interviewing guests on the show for so long, uh, I think maybe about three years now is, is that you get to chance to kind of step back and see patterns. And I've, um, had, a handful of the um, younger startup entrepreneurs on the show. And those folks are usually building very purpose-driven organizations. It's just at the core. Um, so I think very fundamentally about what, you, of what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, purpose-driven. I love that word. I think um, for anyone who's looking to be an entrepreneur out there, um, define your purpose first, right? Define your North star and the, everything else will follow because you'll start to see the steps of what it takes to achieve a particular purpose. Uh, and so for me, I can tell you that my purpose every day is to work at the, uh, the cutting edge of science, to bring that science to people in a positive way that impacts their lives, um, either through their health or, or through their family's health or through their environmental health, their environment's health, whatever it may be doing something to, to bring science to a positive impact. So our positive yeah. results. So, yeah. You know, one of the other things that I've um, kind of noticed over time um, about millennials is um, 
the uh, the ability to or the interest in being candid and transparent on the show <laughs> about about what life is really like, what, um, you know, um, wherever you are in your career, just being really candid and transparent about um, what that's like has, has been really much more um, in tuned with the millennial guests that I've had on the show. Yeah, I think I think that's such a, um, a that's definitely a trend. I think I think people um, in our generation are so much more about sharing things online through social media, so much more open about sharing their own personal struggles with each other um, in person. And this is something that defines your generation because, um, you know, putting on a front of how things actually are um, might have been great when um things were generally going better, but things have been progressively getting worse objectively in our environment, in our personal health. Um, you know, death rates are going up, life expectancy is going down. We can see global warming is, is a rising problem. Um, industry is kind of ravaging a lot of what is um, uh, makes this, what makes our planet great. And I think these are things that objectively are um, not so positive to think about, but um, it's something that we can do to, to counteract this um, overt negativity that's that that we've kind of launched into or thrust into as a generation is to stay positive and stay open with each other and, and think about how we can create purpose driven organizations to counteract these uh, these things. Yeah, and I think it just it normalizes the challenges, and so you just don't feel like it's something's wrong with you or something's wrong with me because I'm experiencing these obstacles that like we're all in this together. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, absolutely. The, it's all just part of the process. Um, so I, I think that it's been very inspiring. That's the feedback that I get from the community is that it's just very inspiring to hear that authenticity and that transparency. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and on that topic, you know, I'm happy to share that um, I, I didn't grow up as a purpose-driven uh, individual. Um, I, I'm not someone who grew up feeling like I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life and that I had everything figured out. In fact, um, most of my life, I didn't have much figured out at all. I just kind of followed what my parents had told me or what society had told me I should be doing. And, and as a result, I actually fell into um, a lot of uh, pretty, pretty long and pretty serious bouts of depression. And I think that's something that um, I'm very happy to talk about with people because a lot of people struggle with this. And um, I was able to uh, manage my own uh, struggles with depression by finding more purpose in my work and finding more purpose and support from the community around me and vice versa by supporting people around me and, and finding other, helping others find their purpose in their work. And so such an important part of, of individual um, kind of accomplishment, but also just communal uh, kind of coming together to bring to do something important and meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, we think that entrepreneurship um, is, um, you know, just all rainbows and butterflies. You hear these stories like Teladoc or Lavongo or, you know, so many more that are just kind of cashing out and IPO and going public and, you know, it's sexy and it sells and but it can also be quite depressing. You know, we also have, you know, theories called the valley of death and the trough of sorrow and you yeah, know, yeah. some of the realities of those ups and downs and, and and so um, I do think being really candid about that can just um, encourage and inspire the whole healthcare innovation community. And ultimately, I think that that type of inspiration just helps us um, keep moving um, in the directions that we were you know, intending to and to have greater commercial success and get those innovations in the hands of the people that need them. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think such an important thing to remember is that um, we can lose track of this as individuals, but the work that we do isn't for ourselves. It's for the world around us. And until we can create an impact on the world around us, you can never become successful um, in anything that you do, right? So anything that you do, if you can create an impact in the lives of people who consume your content or uh, you know, take your drug or um, do something that positively impacts them in a way that they'll come that, that you know that they'll pay money for it, then then you start to become successful. So success is secondary to to make an impact. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step -step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360 degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more 
at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. Isn't that like, duh, we're in healthcare, but it really is something to still be said (laughs) because it needs to be said. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah. If if you're in entrepreneurship to make money, I think, I think, you know, you could be successful, but um, I think going in for make a uh, to make a purposeful impact is is a lot more of a high. It's a it's a better way to go about it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about funding. So this is always a very interesting topic. You've got a lot of conversations about the trends in funding and the billions and trillions of dollars that's being poured into healthcare innovation right now. And um, and then you've got, you know, the stories of those innovators that are in the trenches, you know, early stage, idea stage, um, you know, even, you know, um, a- after several seed rounds that are still struggling to raise money. So from your perspective, you know, what are some of the things that are happening in the marketplace and what do folks need to, to do to get funding? Yeah, uh, that's, that's an amazing question. So um, we can talk first about what's happening in the marketplace right now. So um, I think it's never been a better time to be in biotech. I think um, we have some of the most um, positive uh outlooks of bi- uh, on the industry of biotech that we've had in, in probably decades, as far as I can tell. And um, the amount of money going into biotech at every stage, um, from the seed stage to series A, all the way to IPO and uh, kind of pharma ac- acquisition, um, it's never been more positive uh, in terms of the amount of money going in. So uh, things are really exciting in biotech right now. Um, but the frank truth is we have more money going into biotech than we have new startups. And so the amount of new startups being being created right now, I don't think is is actually changing much from you know five years ago, 10 years ago. It's just a more um, a higher injection of capital. And so to all those would-be entrepreneurs out there who are thinking, should I not, or should I or should I not try starting a company? And you've always had you've been on the tip of your tongue, or you've had an idea. Um, now is a better time than any because there's more money than there are great startups. And so um, now, now is a great time to go into it. And so I guess going into the second topic, you know, how you would raise money. I think um, that there's, there's plenty of people who know way more about this than I do. But what I can say is that the startups that really do a phenomenal job raising money know what their unique value proposition is, know how to sell it, and know that um, every single investor meeting is a chance to build a partnership. It's not where you're trying to raise money and then go on to your next round, round of raising money. It's trying to build a company, li- uh, the, a lifelong partner with the person that you're talking to, um, my lifelong partnership. And so think about building relationships over raising money. And when you start to build relationships, the money comes afterwards. Mm, wow. Um, why are we missing that? I think we're missing that because um, the way that you know we talk about pitching and raising money feels like you're talking to an institution, but institutions are just collections or organizations of people. And so you're going to be talking probably to an associate first and your first pass of trying to raise money. But if you already know the partners at a particular firm, then you can talk to the partners. But ultimately, there's going to be one or two people at most who gathered together and, and they're making a decision about whether or not they're going to give you money. And so um, quit thinking about raising money as talking to an institution or talking to a pool of money and start thinking about building relations with people who want to help you because they're partners with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's such valuable um, ad- advice. Uh, I can't tell you how many um, partners that I speak to that said, you know, they're hearing, you know, five, 10, 15 pitches a day and, you know, half of them, they still have no idea what those folks do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really getting clear on that unique value proposition, I, I think is, um, you know, such a, such a challenge. Why do you think that's a challenge? I think it's a re- thing that USP. Yeah. That unique value proposition. I think it's a real challenge because, um, first, um, you may not have, um, kind of a technology that really is truly unique. So that's, that's, that's challenge number one. Like actually creating unique technology is, is really hard, right? If, 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 whether you're a scientist in the lab or you're a business person who's partnering with scientists, like that's, that's really, really challenging, right? Or if you're in health tech, you know, coming up with a unique um, spin towards uh, healthcare deliveries or, int- or their payer in the PMP system, right? It's, it's all really, really difficult stuff. So first and foremost, it's just challenging to begin with. So no one, I, I don't want to underspeak kind of how difficult this is to create a unique product in the first place. Yeah. yeah. And the second aspect that's really hard is once you do have a unique product, let's say you do have that, you're at that point, um, then messaging it or delivering that message in a way where someone understands 
um, that there is a lot of complexity and nuance to your product or to your idea that it can go a long way in delivering a lot of value to a lot of people without overcomplicating it or getting to the point where they're overwhelmed by the amount of information you're giving them, hitting that sweet spot between the two is such a difficult thing. And so um, when you look at the truly incredible um, founders of our generation, I think they've all been able to do something um, very, very specifically, which is being able to deliver exactly the message they have in mind without either underwhelming or overwhelming their audience. And so that to all, you know, all those aspiring founders, when you can hit that point, then you've really um, kind of a sense, um, you know, hit the jackpot. Yeah. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, I, I think a lot of times the conversation that I have with folks is like the chicken or the egg thing, right? Like I am a, maybe a scientist, maybe an engineer. I have the idea for this innovative tech or this innovative solution. Um, but I am not an expert at developing value propositions or storytelling, um, or balancing, um, you know, what's going to bring clarity versus too much detail. And now I've just like completely, um, bored my audience or confuse them um, at worst. And, and, and so, you know, definitely needing resources, needing funding <laughs> to be able to develop those core assets of the pitch, but also needing to be able to pitch, to be able to get the funding, to be able to, you know, fund the, the better pitch. And, um, and I just see that that's something that a lot of folks still really struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. Chicken or the egg question is a great way to put it. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the frank truth of entrepreneurship too, is that there are a lot of uh, systemic biases that are in the world of entrepreneurship and fundraising. Right. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to uh, raise money. If you happen to come from one of those institutions, for example, as a scientist where money typically flows towards, right. You know, yeah. you're, you're seeing a lot more funding go towards, um, Harvard and Stanford and MIT than you are, um, you know, at, at a lot of other great institutions that are doing amazing work. And so this is an example of just systemic bias that is extremely hard to overcome. And it's just a reality of the system that we live in. But what I will say is more than ever, those assist, um, those into, uh, those institutional barriers that separate us or, um, you know, hi hierarchize us or like, you know, layer us as individuals are starting to break down more and more. You know, nowadays, you know, previously, if you weren't in Boston or the Bay Area, it was extremely hard to get in a meeting with a top investor. But nowadays, anyone can go on a Zoom meeting with anyone, right? And so sure. these yeah. barriers are breaking down. So start thinking about, um, I, I love to think about how um, we can continue to accelerate that process of breaking down barriers and help people with great ideas get the money they deserve to make an impact. Sure. I, you know, I think you make a really good point. I think one of the silver linings of COVID and, you know, there are certainly many of them is one of them is the breaking down of those barriers and for us to kind of rethink how we connect with folks um, in, in this digital or virtual world. And, and that certainly helps us get greater access to um, folks that we might not have come across in those uh, more traditional face-to-face -face encounters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And in an optimal world where things are um, where capital flows to the best ideas and the best people to utilize that capital. Um, I think that's the world that we're moving towards. Um, and I'm very, I'm very hopeful about that. I'm optimistic about that. And of course you can make some negative arguments against that, but you know, to me, I'm all about optimism. And so let's, let's, yeah. I see that trend and I want to continue to amplify it. Absolutely. So let's talk about um, problem solution awareness and that challenge with early stage um, companies. So give our give our listeners a little bit of uh, more context about this challenge, and then let's talk about it. Yeah, problem solution awareness. Um, it's it's a little bit different than what you might normally hear, which is um, uh, pro pro problem. Uh, uh, sorry, um, product market fit. So mo mostly entrepreneurs and, and VCs will talk about product market fit. Um, but another component of product market fit, which is that idea that you have a particular product that you're selling or service that you're selling, the market needs is willing to pay value for and pay money for, right? Um, a, a component of that is problem solution awareness. And so um, and if, you're, if your market or your audience isn't aware of the problem they have or aware that um, a solution exists for a problem they know they have, then uh, you essentially don't have what's called problem solution awareness. And so building problem solution awareness for those markets where either um, your audience isn't aware that there's a problem that they have, or isn't aware that for a problem they do have, there's a solution that exists and they can purchase um, is really important. And so that's an, a critical component of, of kind of eventually building product market fit. It's, it's definitely the key step, right, before product market fit. And so um, what's happening with that? Like, how is that, you know, from your perspective, how is that being skipped over or overlooked? 
Um, I think one of the biggest things that's happening is that, um, you know, for um, these really large institutional players like big pharma companies, um, they spend an immense amount of money on creating problem solution awareness, right? There's an immense budget that goes into advertising for their drugs. Um, But for these smaller startup companies, that can be really challenging. And so you have to really understand how to create problem solution awareness and, and ultimately product market fit. Um, while engaging customers on a very low um, capital budget. And so you have to come up with creative guerrilla marketing strategies. You have to come up with word of mouth strategies, things that can really stretch your dollar very far while still creating that awareness and eventually that um, market base that you need to, to create a successful company. You know, so I'm sure our community gets tired of hearing me talk about this term co-creation. Um, but in my mind, co-creation is the strategy to solve this problem solution awareness issue on zero marketing budget or one-tenth of the marketing budget and zero advertising budget. It's involving customers in that co-creation process really, really early on. Um, And that allows you to be able to get your validation and clinical, clinical efficacy. It allows you to be able to get your early buyers and those folks um, ultimately become part of your external marketing team. um, When you, when you're getting to the co-launch process, um, And I think that those folks having a voice and playing a role in that word of mouth marketing early on is, is, is really, really critical to that commercial success, especially when you're talking about companies like, um, like you had given, um, you know, that are really uh, bootstrapping or, or really strapped for funds on a big advertising and marketing budget. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When your customers become your advocates and your cheerleaders, um, and they become your partners in co-creating your company or your brand or your product, um, I think you have a, an immense value add there. Um, you know, I, I can't, I can think of countless examples where that kind of network effect has amplified the um, value of a product far, far past, um, uh, you know, what could have happened with, you know, a regular traditional advertising uh, kind of approach. Um, and, and one example that comes to top of mind is Tesla, right? Tesla spends absolutely zero dollars on over marketing budget or advertising budget, right? Everything is through word of mouth and through um, kind of the branding that cars themselves provide and that Elon provides through his, you know, Twitter feed and other social media routes. But right, right. I, that's such a great example of, you know, people who are Tesla owners aren't just car owners. They are, they are cheerleaders for Tesla. They are advocates. They are like fanatical about Tesla. And, it's, and that's an a great example of, you know, go, getting your customers as co-creators to create extremely valuable brands and companies. Yeah. And I think that that solves for a couple of problems that you had mentioned is, is one, like the, the number one reason why we don't get product market fit or we don't have commercial success is because there's no need for the solution anyway. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and so being able to involve customers that will tell you that your baby is ugly or tell you that your idea is, is not relevant and meaningful really, really early on, I think is, is, is so critical. Um, and then being able to shape what that might look like is, is also really powerful. Um, so Eric, this has just been a very great conversation. Is there anything else that you would want to share with our community um, based upon um, your experience and observations? Yeah. The the last thing I would say is that um, believe in yourself and the unique value that you bring to the world and every single relationship you have, because um, I believe that everyone has something incredible they can do with their lives. And the sooner that you start shedding the mental shackles that we all place on ourselves um, for whatever reason, or have been placed on us, um, the sooner you start shedding those mental shackles, the more you can start accomplishing the incredible things that you didn't know you could do. And so that's the position I've been very grateful to have in my life. And I hope that everyone can listen and can also begin to shed their own mental shackles and do some incredible things. Wow. That's great. What a great way to end today's conversation. Imagine what uh, the world would be like if we could all shed those mental shackles. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Incredible. I can't even uh, imagine it. So yeah. Right. Right. Oh my yeah. goodness. Freedom. <laughs> um, so how would folks get a hold of you if they want to follow up with you after the show? Yeah. Feel free to reach out to me through my, um, my work email, which is eric at petri.bio. So that's E-R-I-C at P-E-T-R-I dot B-I-O. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Roxy, Dr. Roxy. It's great, to, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. 
Thank you for listening. And I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.